I'd like to welcome you all to our panel discussion and interactive workshop on engaging narratives in civic space. Um, I just have a few quick housekeeping notes to start, which I think will be, wait, I can do this? There we are. Uh, my name is David Saldivar, I'm with Oxfam, um, and I'm grateful for you all to be here today. Um, I'm gonna just uh, introduce what we're doing today, run through the plan for the afternoon, um, starting with just a, the housekeeping notes that I mentioned. First, um, we are part of what we're doing today is uh, together with Just Labs amplifying a, a piece of work that they are launching uh, a new paper around the, the topics that we're going to be discussing under the title of Be the Narrative. So if you're um, doing social media today, feel free to use the hashtag Be the Narrative, um, which leads me into uh, the next couple of housekeeping points. Um, because um, we're privileged to be joined by colleagues from around the world, um, including some folks who work in contexts that are quite restricted, and we're going to be talking about um, some topics that might be um, sensitive, I would just ask that you, um, if you're going to post anything that's identifiable of somebody, just make sure you verify with that person before you do so, or, or restrict your, uh, your public posting to things that are sort of more general in nature. I'd like to introduce uh, G. Kim, who will introduce our panel. Um, G, uh, for the past two decades, has been a movement builder, a resource mobilizer, and a dot connector for social change involving uh, a prior role here at Ford, uh, and before that, as the founder of 18millionrising.org, a platform to increase the political power of Asian Americans using social media and technology. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to G. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, I travel here all the way from Brooklyn, uh, so <laughs> I think my commute may have been easier, but it's great to meet all of you um, from the many corners of the globe. Um, so I run an organization called the Narrative Initiative. Our mission is to make equity and justice common sense. And for that reason, narrative for us is important because it's a means of engaging the process of sense making, how you create what becomes a common sense both for individuals, but also acknowledging that sense-making is also something that's held in communities. Uh, so the relationship between the individual and the community as well. So we distinguish very much like the folks at Oxfam, uh, different levels, differences between uh, stories and narratives and values and worldviews. Uh, at the most surface and maybe the most confusing level, we think of things like tweets and messages but then we think of stories beneath them and narratives beneath them and values and worldviews ultimately um, uh, really at the core and at the base. But the narratives are really important because you can't simply approach someone or a community and engage them at the level of And this is one of the presidential candidates uh, of the Democratic Party. It's Elizabeth Warren. There's a very well-known saying called, I have a plan. Uh, and she uses that really to, um, I think, uh, put forward a, a semi-narrative um, and one that's trying to capture the meaning or the value of, uh, the meaning of the value of security, essentially. And what she's saying is that there is a threat, corporate greed, the elites, monopoly power, uh, that requires very smart plans that she can protect us from and the, uh, from these threats. And all the stories that she tells about her childhood, uh, about people that she meets, uh, are meant to reinforce this narrative. Uh, so that's one example. The next, does anyone else, uh, uh, does anyone know who this is? Show of hands, if you know who this is. Oh, oh, very popular. This is my favorite and only Asian American running for president, um, uh, Andrew Yang, although Kamala Harris is technically half. Um, and Andrew Yang ha also has a quasi-narrative, this thing called the Freedom Dividend, which is basically a universal guaranteed income where he would write a check, the US government would write a check every month to every American citizen uh, to, uh, 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 in, in what he calls a Freedom Dividend. And I would offer that Andrew Yang and Elizabeth Warren are offering competing narratives 
to contest the meaning of the value of security. And in this case, Andrew Yang thinks that this is a mode of security from the threat of robots, essentially, from automation. Uh, and he has created a narrative and all of the stories that he offers about the cash register workers who no longer have jobs or the truck drivers who will not have jobs in a decade from now are meant to buttress uh, this narrative. But what, as I mentioned before, um, uh, we believe that there are things called deep narratives that are often not visible that animate these narratives. And these are two examples of people offering narratives pointing to the same value of security, but in fact, they are premised on very different deep narratives. And the deep narrative that I would point to in this case is around the role of government. Uh, and in the case of Elizabeth Warren, I have a plan is really an argument for a very robust role of government in protection, in security. And in Andrew Yang, who is a tech entrepreneur and even in this very specific language of a dividend, uh, which is uh, kind of an economic language around shareholder um, profits uh, and rights, Andrew Yang really does not put forward a deep narrative or is not premised on a deep narrative of a more robust government that can serve this function. So I just offer this um, very simple diagram that we use to um, illustrate um, different levels that I mentioned. And the ocean is a very um, uh, intentional one because we think that narratives are like currents and that currents generate waves at the top of the ocean and they're often invisible and that currents are often contradictory. So it's not like you have consistent narratives always, uh, but that you can combine and repurpose currents to drive stories and messages. And ultimately at the top of the ocean is when you're fighting um, with tweets, essentially. Uh, so this is a, a metaphor that I would offer um, uh, just as a, a framework. So I would also say that in addition to this framework, we also, one of our core beliefs is that narrative change is multidisciplinary. It certainly requires really sophisticated strategic communications, but it's not just about communications. Uh, narratives are uh, formed and reinforced in how you design protests and policy, and also in the workplace and in the subway, not just on your screens. Uh, and narrative ultimately cannot be separated with questions of power. It's not like narrative is a way to get around the question of economic power or political power. It's simply a tool uh, and can't be separated from these other modes of power. And you'll see this reflection of multidisciplinary approaches, how we think about narrative vis-a-vis -vis power in the speakers that we have here today and the range of approaches uh, that they represent. So uh, this is how we'll do it. Each person will speak for 10 minutes to talk about their work, introduce it. Uh, then we'll get into some Q&A. We don't have a lot of time for Q&A, but uh, as was mentioned earlier, we'll break into small groups so that you can dig in deeper with each panelist. So does that sound okay? Great. So first, let's start with Julia, who is the president of Partners Global. Thank you so much. Um, okay, well, what a pleasure to be here, and I really enjoyed spending time with you all yesterday. Um, and so I feel like I got a little bit of an advance um, chance to kind of give you my perspective on, on this. And so, yes, I have an initiative. I'm uh, based in Washington, D.C., and we work on uh, narratives for peace. And because language is um, so important, I feel the need to kind of clarify when we say narratives for peace, um, and I'm actually in the game right now of trying to rebrand what does peace mean to people, mm. um, you all might say to yourself, well, yeah, that's interesting. I'm definitely into peace too, but I don't really work on peace. I'm not living in a conflict environment. I'm not necessarily actively kind of working against war in Yemen. Um, so I'm, I don't really see myself in that world. And I want to say our Narratives for Peace initiative takes a much broader perspective of, of peace and peace building. So when we talk about peace, we talk about positive peace. It's a very academic term. We have negative peace and positive peace. There's the absence of violence. There's the absence of threat of violence. And then there's all of the ways that we keep societies peaceful and democratic governance, and human rights, access to information, economic development, 
all of these factors help to keep societies peaceful. And so part of what our narratives initiative is trying to accomplish is to broaden an umbrella of understanding of who is actually working for peace and how are they doing their work. Um, now with that said then, if my work is as a peace builder, I feel that my work around narrative engagement actually starts with me. And it starts with the people who are trying to make the change in the world. So I love this Rumi quote, because I think social justice activists, the quote unquote social justice warriors out there in the world, and if you don't know, in the United States, that can be seen as a derogatory term. If you're a social justice warrior, um, there's a lot of people that roll their eyes at you. Um, and sometimes I think this uh, need for self-reflection about how I need to change myself and I need my own self-reflection in order to then be able to do the work on engaging with the narratives is one of the most important lessons. And I want to hold ourselves to a higher standard because we're trying to be in the world as peace builders with that broad umbrella in all of that includes. So I am the CEO of Partners Global. We're based in Washington, DC. We just celebrated our 30th anniversary. We came out of the um, democracy building movement of 1989. So when the fall of the Berlin Wall fell and there was a rush of activity to support that transition to democratic institutions, um, we started investing in local affiliates in Central and Eastern Europe, a little bit of a franchise model. Partners Poland, Partners Bulgaria, Partners Hungary, Partners Czech Republic, Partners uh, uh, Slovakia. We now have 20 of those affiliates around the world. Um, they are completely independent local organizations and they form the Partners Network. So I am not in the business anymore of setting up affiliates. We have a robust network. We're working in over 50 countries. But what I do want to say is that this uh, call for working on narrative engagement bubbled up from my network. So previous to 2016, we started reflecting on what was happening in Central and Eastern Europe, that the values of liberal democracy and membership in the U European Union were coming into question. Our colleagues in Central America and throughout Latin America were saying, we're working on human rights. And yet somehow the values of human rights are being questioned and the hard security, mano dura, is winning out in the public conversation at this point. And we're very good at dialogue. We're very good at citizen engagement. We bridge conflict resolution, peace building. We make sure that citizens have a voice. And yet somehow the techniques we're using don't seem to be sufficient for us to be able to battle these values challenges. And we actually didn't even know what to call it back then. We didn't know to call it narrative engagement. But we've um, held a, a, a goal for ourselves to develop new tools in our toolbox, um, which then led us to our Narratives for Peace initiative. And so I wanted to just highlight a couple of key learnings for me, because I personally, this was a presidential initiative, I went on my own learning journey around um, narrative engagement. And I, I, I use that term purposefully. I don't talk about narrative change. Hmm. And some of you were in a small group with me yesterday and heard me say that, is I think narrative change um, indicates something, you're wrong and I'm right and I need to change your mind. And I want to engage with narratives. Um, I want to um, respect different worldviews. And so that led me to a school of thought around narratives, which is narrative and conflict. So there's a school at George Mason University, um, at, which is in Virginia, fairly close to Washington, DC, that has an institute on narrative and conflict resolution. And so a lot of my um, research really was grounded in, well, how is narrative engagement being applied to conflict situations? And not just interpersonal conflicts, because there's narrative identities, there's a way of like family therapy, you can talk mm -hmm. through your stories and try and come to resolution. But we are dealing with societal conflicts right now that are manifesting through the stories that have since the day humans were on this planet. And there's a whole field of study for over three, 30 years, 
more so, that has been um, unfolding. So what were my key ahas? When, and because I had to do a lot of trying to translate this very dense academic research to anything that could be practical to me. And so one of the things, and, and, and Jay absolutely kind of jumped the gun to say, you, narratives is a way of making meaning of the world. And we use it so interchangeably to talk about kind of how we're crafting stories and strategic communications. But when I think about the way that human beings make sense of the world are the stories that we tell ourselves as individuals, the stories that we tell ourselves about the communities that we live in, the way we filter the information is through stories. So if I think about sense making, that, that helps me. But the other thing that helps me um, is that meaning is made in the mind of the receiver of whatever communication. It is, I am not making meaning for you. And so that old model of strategic communications, I have something to say, I'm gonna make sure to, that it gets to you in a really creative way so I can keep your attention or that somehow I'm gonna <coughs> protect the um, message um, so that it gets to you in the way I intended it to get to you, that person will make meaning of that message based on their own narratives, mm -hmm. understandings. And so that then makes me think that I have my own cognitive biases. Me as the sender, what absolutely makes perfect sense to me is not gonna make perfect sense to you. So if I'm gonna engage in narrative, um, work in the public sphere, I've got to remember that um, not everybody thinks like me, which then therefore means when I think about my narrative strategies, I'm not going to group a bunch of people who think exactly like me to come up with what my meta narrative is for my campaign. And so what are like my three main messages then when I am with my groups and my coalitions? Because I am, I am, we work in coalition. Partners Global is committed to collective action. And a lot of us feel that sense of urgency to be working collectively on campaigns. But do we take the time to be self-reflective of our own cognitive biases? Do we stop and think, this feels really good to me? <laughs> Why does it feel good to me? Why are these the stories that I feel the most comfortable in? Because then do I have curiosity of other narratives? Am I aware of what those narratives are? We just looked at different two different democratic politicians um, who are progressive and who are liberal and who probably share a worldview of most of the people in this room. And where, I, I'm not criticizing the fact that you didn't have, you know, Mitch McConnell up there, that's totally fine. And yet we do need to explore, maybe there are autocratic politicians out there that are manipulating the public conversation in the countries where many of you work. And yet there are many, many people in those communities that are buying into a narrative who have a lived experience, there has to be curiosity about that. And then finally, is my goal to change a narrative? Is it to have a stronger, more powerful narrative? What I've learned from the people who work in conflict is that one of my calls is to complexify the narrative. And I love the term that Sarah Cobb wrote a book, and I can't remember the book title now, but Sarah Cobb, C-O-B-B, -B, she talks about narrative braiding so that you can have your narrative and your understanding and your identity and I can have mine and we're going to braid those together and we're going to hopefully come out with an understanding of, of a place that we can um, both feel comfortable with moving forward. So then finally, this feeds into a broader civil society resilience on the break or at the reception. I could talk all day about uh, civil society resiliency. And then finally, this, this feeds into, for us, a new advocacy approach, which is a restorative advocacy approach. I think some of us who are working for social change are unwittingly contributing to the increased polarization in our societies. And um, partially, it's through our communications efforts. And not only are we causing harm, um, or maybe not even bringing the right allies to our side, but we're further polarizing the societies and we're looking at new tools for advocacy that's more restorative. So thank you very much for the invitation. It's really been a joy to spend these time with you and I really look forward to hearing from the other panels. <laughs> wow, thank you, Julia. Um, let's, uh, yes, please. Um, now I'd love to turn it over to Thomas, uh, who is the Director of Hope-Based Communications and a member of Just Labs.
with this exciting new report that was mentioned earlier. Um, so yeah, thanks very much. So yeah, Just Labs is um, a relatively new collective. I'm one of several or a dozen sort of uh, people who are part of this collective all over the world, come from many different fields. And our goal is essentially we want to change the DNA of the human rights movement. We don't accept the narrative of the current state we're in as a crisis or um, for our movement, but actually an opportunity to undertake the radical transformation that our movement needs to take um, using new technologies. Our, our logo is a paperclip because the whole idea of paperclip is a simple piece of steel that's bent into a new shape to bring people together. And that's what we want to do at the current moment. And our, one of our main focuses is, is populism and how do we help the human rights NGOs around the world who are working on it. But our, our principle also is that for us, the human rights movement is a global movement. It's about organizations working together. And we were very inspired by work um, by such a narrative initiative and um, frameworks and all the research coming out, Framework Institute. Uh, but we were looking at how can national NGOs who are facing, who are being undermined by narratives, respond. Uh, and one of the things we very quickly realized was if we're just responding to narratives and countering and myth busting, we're not really doing narrative. And so the title is inspired actually by a story that comes out of um, the book of Dan Pfeiffer, who was Barack Obama's uh, communications director when they came up with their be the chain um, with their uh, change you can believe in message they were brainstorming all the different titles and Obama according to Pfeiffer says what you do is the message and so the point was that they were comfortable with that message because Barack Obama himself embodied that change and so our message to human rights organizations in our labs was you have to be the narrative you can't just decide to start using some words it's also about what is it actually that people will think of doing human rights. And so I'll take you through a little bit of, of the journey. So essentially, we, we basically all, we brought together 12 human rights organizations from 12 different countries facing different levels of populist threat. Um, so not just sort of the global south, but also the UK and Australia, where human rights policies are being undermined. And we're going on the, the basic principle here that actually you know, human, human rights itself exists in law, but actually people only obey those laws because of stories that people and, and so what, what populists are doing is undermining the norms that we thought were safe uh, with the stories they're telling. And so what we want to look at is what are the stories we will now tell ourselves to reverse and put in place that, that new narrative. Uh, and so what we did within our labs, we held f uh, four different labs around um, in different locations with these organizations. And we were looking at trying to bring in some design thinking and experts from digital marketing and branding and political science, what are the actual stories we tell, the actual things these human rights organizations can do that if the story of what they do is told, will start to constitute that new narrative that actually newspaper articles, people posting on social media. So essentially a different idea of what it means to be a human rights organization. And a lot of the organizations in the labs were saying, we just want to even be able to say the word human rights uh, mm -hmm. and not sound like uncool. <laughs> sound <laughs> a little just so essentially, we the, this this is a project that, that the report speaks to the first phase of our project where we try to brainstorm, get these new ideas out. We're now in a phase of experimentation in four countries, trying to roll these prototypes out and actually basically run narrative change campaigns. And at the end of the project, we will have a, a learning and dissemination phase where we will actually bring all of these findings um, to everyone and, and through a narrative hub actually share the examples of tactics and the narratives that work. And I can come back to a little bit of that at the end. So we, we started off with some of the very simple tools such as sort of power mapping and things. But what was we really worrying to us about this, we immediately saw that actually all of our allies are quite weak in terms of narrative power. So we knew that we just, a lot of our work would have to be elevating those allies up into a higher quadrant where they, you know, the people who share our narrative can make their voice heard. But for that, we needed new, newer allies. Um, and so we, we basically summarized a little bit the, the sort of dynamic here as we try to understand what is it about populism that's undermining our human rights NGOs. We, we know some of the basics, but like fundamentally, what are our core goals? And actually, once the sort of these mainly lawyers started to come around together, they started to actually put their finger on things like people don't want to take part anymore. We can have calm conversations 
um, uh, so uh, there's not enough caring or empathy for each other anymore. And so actually, we then started to think of the challenge less in terms of shrinking space or laws of policies, but actually, what does it actually mean to be human rights? What are the end goals? And at the end of the day, we want a society where people take part, where people take care of each other. And that then we sort of identified, okay, the things that populists are doing, their narrative strategies are conflict, controversy, and chaos that create that sense of a society in conflict. And so a lot of the times we then play a role in that. So at first, the temptation of the organizations in these labs was the populists say one thing, our campaign will be all based on what they said. You say this, well, so one politician said um, charities in the UK should go back to their knitting. So the UK organization, they wanted to say, well, we knit together the social fabric, but just constantly being driven by what the actions and the words of our opponents. So instead, we ended up with a set of strategies that instead of responding and take, you know, be always being goaded and basically trolled by populists um, and attacking them back, which feeds their narrative of conflict, we came up with strategies of community, cooperation, and culture. So community being, in it, just in its own sake, reaching the people we're trying to reach in their own space. So in a bar where they watch football, um, just to actually be able to have the, for those conversations to happen that, again, are a fundamental part of what we want to see in the world. To have reach people through culture on a sort of apolitical level with our values. So in museums, in comedy clubs. Uh, and again, not just as a means to promote a policy or a campaign, but actually as an end in itself. Uh, and then finally, cooperation. So working with companies, um, uh, newspapers, influencers to, again, not just to reach new people with our message in a different way, but again, just to actually have more of that cooperation in society. So those were actual tools, but they were also means in an end. Partly, so those, those basically, um, those tactics are now going to run out, but there are some other findings from the report, which is when we started talking about those new ways of doing human rights, the key words, the, the, the ingredients of those, what is a new narrative of human rights we can use? So we're trying to shift the way we realize like image of a protest is actually feeding again that sense of mm -hmm. these angry people, they're divided, there's one side and the other, there's good people on both sides, and also shifting a little bit away from that traditional language of rights and actually focusing a bit more on, on the humanity aspect. Um, so, one, so for example, one of the uh, prototypes that came out was from Mexico would be one of these uh, spoofs where you, they show uh, like an actor impersonates the president and has the president say, commit to all the things we want to do. Uh, another example was, um, so Instagram. So we, we actually, within our labs, were very, put our human rights friends into a different sort of space, forcing them to like act things out and act out what the uh, prototype would be. So in one case, there's a lot of people like posting to Instagram, doing things with companies. Um, so we actually, it was very key that you would, people would be part of the narrative themselves. They would actually, so this is, um, and sort of an Australian, the head of an Australian legal NGO acting out, coming to the booth and telling their story as part of one campaign. Another example, hopefully, will, um, will be in Venezuela, they were going to take a food truck and turn it into a truck that would go and deliver rice to the community. Uh, in Hungary, they would take a YouTube influencer and have them tour the country and get young people to vote. One core thing that underlined is we, what we did afterwards was analyze the language we were using to describe these new activities, these new prototypes, and how are we actually talking about human rights? And that's the thing we really took away from uh, work like narrative initiatives. Actually, we need to work on narrative, but it's also hard to actually do that narrative when we are not cognizant of what our meta narrative is. What is our shared belief about what human rights are, how they work, and why they matter? Um, and so, we also started to sort of try, can we articulate what is that common story we tell around human rights? And we were inspired by work of Anat Schenker Osorio, a cognitive linguist who's done some research on how we talk. And basically, we, we looked at the language used in the labs to find, here are three potential new ways of talking about human rights. So how it works, how not human rights is something that will protect you from harm, but a thing our, our supporters, those communities, can use to achieve change in their society. So one is that human rights shows us the way forward. It's a roadmap, it's like rules of the road that we use to treat each other better. Another is human rights as a plan that shows like for the better world we want to build. And my personal favorite is this idea of human rights <coughs> as glue. 
human rights is what binds us together in our shared humanity. And that's the idea here is that we wouldn't actually go around showing people like tubes of glue, squirting it at them and sticking them together. <laughs> but it's about using the language that people need to stick together, uh, that we're connected, that we use language. So basically, when we make the case for things, we're not saying, well, this is good for the economy, because that's not what drives us. We're saying that we're all human. We should treat each other that way. And so that's also a piece of work that now is something we want to work with all of you on actually finding ways to test if these, these meta narratives make sense uh, and roll them out. The final thing that it points out as well is just what is the actual narrative infrastructure organizations need to build. So it's really key for us that small organizations, even if they can't afford like large research projects or work with creative agencies, you're doing narrative anyway. With, with everything you do, whether you like it or not. And so one be, um, what can you already start doing? First of all, not to do harm, to reinforce negative ideas. Uh, and what are the long-term changes we all as a movement need to bring about? I think for me, one thing that really stands out, well, there was the ability to organize, so to have more organizers in our community. Right now, human rights groups are really dominated by lawyers. And that works crucial, but we also need the organizers to build those communities, but we desperately need the digital marketing infrastructure, people who can do social listening, uh, who can put those targeted ads out, which people like Elizabeth Warren are doing massively. And we feel, so one thing Just Labs wants to do now is bring people together to, to build that capacity together. The, the basic point, um, so here to end with a metaphor, is that seeing our, our movement a little bit like an orchestra, if we're all playing different music, it's not going to sound that great. Um, but we, if we're all singing on tune, then it will start to sound uh, a little bit better. And so the key point here is we're all in this room because we share values. We share a view of how the world works. And the uh, first step, we think, to actually making that change is that together we agree on what it is so that then we can start finding the stories that show that our worldview is actually the right way to see the world. Thank you, Thomas. Round of applause. <coughs> um, I've heard so many common themes, and I have so many questions, uh, but I will pause on my questions, and I hope you're thinking about questions as well, um, so that we can get to um, our third panelist, Shireen, um, who is the incoming executive director yes. of Just Associates. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> I got it right. Um, Shireen, Hi. the floor is yours. Okay. Uh, thanks very much for the introduction and to my fellow panelists. Um, Everybody doing okay? Yeah, <laughs> following? Um, great. <laughs> um, sometimes you can get lulled, right? <laughs> By so much information. Um, I think I'm going to shift gears a little bit. And for those who were in the room yesterday, um, you know, just introduce our work as Jazz or just Associates. Um, we are a movement building support organization. And we work largely with women and gender justice activists and the organizations in three different regions around the world, um, Southeast Asia, Southern Africa, and Central America, um, and are doing some light work in, in, in the US too. I think as a feminist movement building organization, our work has always orientated around a really explicit analysis of power and building power. And for us, it's that work that really centers narratives, yeah? Um, I think from a women's rights perspective or a feminist perspective, um, we know that women have been demonized over time, and history shows us that. Um, and we also know that capital, as well as the other brother-isms, right, like nationalism and you know, racism, sexism, um, even homophobia, um, have really worked against those that in terms of the mainstream are seen as other. Yeah? And I think that our approach is really resting on the basis that institutions, ideology, socialization, right, are all about winning hearts and minds. And those ideas are deep. They rooted in a value system. And it is those ideas that get hooked Right, or those beliefs that get hooked when we are thinking about the traction right, of stories and narratives. And so I think if we look at where we are today, um, we can you know, wear that slide 
um, sort of becomes important, um, we are seeing around the world the dismantling of democratic institutions. Um, we're also seeing the rise of authoritarianism. And we're reminded about the different ways that people who are not recognized by a mainstream system um, are, are discounted or being controlled or repressed. Um, and given all of this, for us, a close reading of power becomes, becomes really, really important in order to understand and identify actors, interests, and beliefs, and how it is that narratives are then being manipulated or used, right, to push certain ideas over others. Um, so very, very briefly um, on the slide, um, we identify three faces of power. Visible power, which is largely the state, hidden power, um, which is largely about those forces, organizations, institutions, even people who are, who are influencing, right? Who are influencing the state in different ways to push a very, very specific agenda. And then we have invisible power, um, which is really the norms, beliefs, um, values, ideologies that underpin how it is that we understand ourselves in the world and how it is that the world operates. For us, that is where the power of narratives lies. Right? It's in that realm of invisible power where we feel as part of a movement building strategy, we are needing to do the most amount of work to shift the norms and values that underpin policies and laws. So you can have the most amazing policies and laws if change is not happening at that deep substructure, it's actually not going to have traction. And so to understand that, to understand that is there, that discrimination and prejudice, that internalized oppression, lies, yeah, becomes really, really important as a step towards transformation and building collectives that can work towards change. And so the next slide, very, very quickly, um, speaks to what we call transformative power. And it is really here that the work of narratives, narrative change and shifts lies for us as part of our movement building approach. Now, what does this mean? It means that we work in very, very careful and deliberate ways with communities, with organizations, with people at community level, right? To be able to really think through and unpack what I guess in big language you would call internalized oppression. Yeah. And for us, there are a number of sources of, of transformative power. It starts here, right? It starts with really acknowledging that I matter. Yeah. Power within. And not only that I matter, but that my life story counts. Right. And I think we create safe spaces where that work happens. It's process work. It takes years and years and years. It's not linear. But I think power within leads you organically to working and naming power with. Right? That I can stand with others right? in, order to, in order to do something, in order to act. Yeah? Um, and I think once you move, once you move to that realm, um, you get closer to thinking about what is the common ground? Mm -hmm. What is the world view? Mm -hmm. Does it matter if I am a lesbian and you are a sex worker? Does it matter if I am from a Zimbabwe and you are from a Honduras? Right? How do we connect our stories in a way that allows for an analysis of the global right, structure in order to be able to recognize that actually my struggle is the same as your struggle because we are living within the same system. I think that leads then to power two, right, which is the capacity to speak out, right, to question, to imagine, and to make choices. And often we find that this work, which is deep work, is work that happens in very intimate spaces. It's about building, I think, what you referenced, Thomas, community, right, finding the common values making making the vision collectively which takes me to power four right that shared vision 
mm. and our story for the future that we want to live in then, but also make now in terms of laying the path. I think as part of as part of this, I'm not sure what the next slide is. So this is going to be an interesting <laughs> moment, but it's fine. It'll work. <laughs> um, as as part of this, then, um, you know how it is that we craft or resurface our our worldviews. How it is that we unpick the sets of structural oppressions that devalue us becomes really, really important day-to-day -day work as part of movement building, yeah? And I think that this picture kind of encapsulates um, an, an aspect of it. This is from Malawi, where we work with HIV positive women who are largely rural based. Um, and over a period of almost eight years, we worked with religious leaders. I think this speaks to your point, right? Working across the, div the divides, right? We worked with religious leaders, both Christian and Muslim, in order to you know, come to an agreement around using the pulpit and the member for progressive um, interventions around HIV, including voluntary testing and counseling, et cetera, et cetera. And so this picture was a March deployment. Um, and you know, there you have the bishops and the reverends and the imams you know, actually holding the banner, women crossing the line, uh, which is about transgression, right? And which is about women's agency and collective power in action, um, which for us was a very interesting visual. Now, I speak about the visual because I think it is as much about that as it is about the words, yeah? And how it is that we then tap into um, communities, indigenous knowledge systems, as we spoke about yesterday, cultural production as very, very powerful vehicles, right? to both put forward new narratives, live new narratives, be the narrative in the street, mm -hmm. right, if necessary, um, as well as claim space and, and challenge, you know, the more conservative mainstream narratives that are contributing to further, further oppression and, and marginalization. Um, so I have one minute. I think, <laughs> I'm gonna <laughs> I think I'm gonna end on the point that context matters, right? Context matters. What makes sense in, you know, Honduras, we can learn from, but may not necessarily translate, literally and figuratively, um, you know, in the Philippines mm -hmm. or in Zimbabwe. And so context matters um, in, in doing narrative work. And narratives for us is and has always been a vital part of movement. Um, in terms of strategy and in terms of supporting cross issue mm -hmm. and cross geography mm -hmm. um, and cross movement alliances in seeing, imagining, and living into a different kind of world. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Shireen. Thank you. <laughs> oh, there's one more picture. <laughs> <laughs> So we have about 20, 25 minutes for some group question and answer. Can I see a, a, a show of hands if you have a question that you're ready to jump in with? I thought we could start with a few. Um, any hands, any immediate questions jump to mind? Well, I'll let you think a little bit more about your questions uh, because I have plenty. And so why don't I just start with one? Um, I'm personally, and we as an organization are uh, really focused on this question of populism, um, partially because we think narrative has a particular role in populism, in the rise of populism, but also in confronting it. Um, and all of you named authoritarianism and populism as a key uh, challenge or shared challenge, and also named that we sometimes uh, exacerbate uh, polarization, that the old ways of working um, sometimes narrow our social basis, uh, mm -hmm. as, as you described, Shireen, our common ground. So let me just start with a provocative question, which is, um, is it ever necessary to polarize? Do we need to polarize? Do we need to create a they in order to have a more clearly defined us? Uh, and if so, how to best do that? Um, and if not, why should we not polarize? Um, so I want to dig a little bit into actually questions of strategy around 
our own narratives uh, and how we meet this kind of authoritarian moment that we find ourselves in for any or all of you. I have a very strong reaction to that, so I'll <laughs> jump in. Um, so <sighs> movement building, you know, social change that we want to make, strategies for claiming um, rights and tactics to have that happen, hopefully the day comes where we win. Mm -hmm. And then we are in a society with others that needs to have a, a valve for differences of opinion to be able to be resolved democratically. Mm -hmm. And we want to create, if we're gonna really put ourselves out to vision, where, what is the world we wanna live in? We wanna live in a world where conflict happens because that drives change, and yet we have the right places for the difference of opinions to be discussed, negotiated, resolved peacefully, and with a transparent and legitimate process of decision making to happen where rights are respected and we all move forward. And if we perpetuate an us and them in our tactics to make the change happen to then get to the democratic society, mm -hmm. then we will perpetuate in a system that is just going to have the power imbalances back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, because we're going to tamp down your worldview so that mine wins. Mm -hmm. And then therefore, so what, my criticism of the movement building tactics in the way that we want to create a them because then we want to win doesn't set up us up for what happens next. Mm -hmm. And we've got to be set up for what happens mm -hmm. next. And it has to give a place, whether it's you know the struggle for anti-apartheid mm -hmm. and what came afterwards with all of the kind of reconciliation that needed to happen in that democratic society for there to be a place for people to find themselves in the future of that society, I, I strongly believe that I don't know. Now, it doesn't mean don't confront. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean no, don't name. It doesn't mean don't strive for the change. <coughs> but creating the them isn't going to set us up, I think, for um, what comes next when we actually do grab mm -hmm. power. Mm. I see. I see Shireen leaning forward. <laughs> yes, I'm thinking. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think as we vision mm -hmm. the world that we want, mm -hmm. and as we create the conditions now mm -hmm. to claim it, we we cannot replicate, mm -hmm. right? The the power struggles or the dominant, mm -hmm. yes, in what it is that we're doing. So I think for me, that's very very clear. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got to fashion and weave. A different social fabric mm -hmm. that you know is more inclusive to use all of the language you know th that, that Thomas used earlier. I do think though if one takes the long view mm -hmm. and one looks at history mm -hmm. right I mean and thinking about the anti-apartheid struggle mm -hmm. you know that you've mentioned and us and them was inherent in the system mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. black people did not count mm -hmm. and white people did mm -hmm. And so when you are in a reality that is as stark as that, mm. your tactics and your strategies, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. are yes in response, mm -hmm. while at the same time mm -hmm. fashioning something different. Mm -hmm. I think where we've been weak is in the visioning mm -hmm. and in the crafting now mm -hmm. of what it is that we need to put in place mm -hmm. in order to live into. Mm -hmm. Once we get to that point, mm -hmm. but I think that's where we've been wobbly, and that's a challenge even for us today. Mm -hmm. I think how do we do that? Because if one again looks at history, in the countries where we really believed that there was hope mm -hmm. in struggles for liberation, liberation arrived, mm -hmm. and then what? Mm -hmm. And there is something inherent mm -hmm. in that formula about power, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Once a movement consolidates itself into a government or into a state. Mm -hmm. Right. Something right. happens. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. And so I think for me, it's really important mm -hmm. to hold that yep. mm -hmm. in response to your question. Yep. Exactly. Thomas, anything to add yeah. before I turn to the audience? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I struck a nerve. That's good. Um, I think it's a brilliant question because I work in human rights. It's something I was thinking a lot, especially in 2016, when for me, my, my, my worldview on human rights had to change because it had been never again. And I saw in Europe that that message was failing I, before my very eyes. 
And for a long time, my message has been like, European rights are about helping people. And then, but one thing I realized is every time I said European, I was reminding Europeans mm. that the people coming weren't European. <laughs> yeah. And so mm. actually, mm. I tried to think, though, what is the in-group we create? If you believe yeah. in human rights, the group we're trying to create is the human family, essentially. Um, and so it's harder work than what the opponents can do, but that's our goal. It's just mm. a different set of work. And then one thing I was thinking, for example, actually something that was a very powerful idea. I'd love to do research to see if people who watched Star Trek uh, are more progressive because that's about it. <laughs> we're all human. Yeah. But like on, on migration, every time we say the word border, we lose. Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. And so actually that comes back to this point of what is the goal of human rights work. And so what I'm trying to do is essentially rebrand it, that it's the laws are <coughs> means to an end and that end is shared humanity and empathy that's extended to other people just because they're human. And that mm -hmm. then goes to the point of what, what do we do with the other, the people who do things that today disgust us? Someone's going to have to show empathy first at some point if that's going to change. And I started to think of anger as CO2. Like we're excited by anger on our side and terrified of it on the other side. But we can't just think our anger won't lead to anger on the other side. If we want a world with less anger, someone's going to have to start pushing some hope out. And that, that also speaks to actually, when we're anti things, do we inadvertently feed them? So we say populism is on the rise. Everyone's talking about populism. There's no alternative, right? We're actually, one, one exercise I do is for, aspirational foresight. What are the things happening right now, happening right now that we're really happy about? Actually, the people on the rise are young people. Deep, <laughs> higher level of empathy in our world than ever. We've got people connected by the internet. We need to actually start focusing on celebrating the things we're for rather than just always focusing on, on the antis and actually thinking, when we're against something, if we're against racism, what's the opposite of that that we can cultivate? Yes. That's tolerance and togetherness. Thank you. Uh, I saw a couple hands. I'll take three or four at a time, please. OK. So uh, human rights, the conventional wisdom was human rights was something, was values plus in a way, yeah. something more legitimate. Mm -hmm. So here's what I struggle with, because I'm in accord with everything you're all saying. But what I struggle with, are we losing something? Mm -hmm. If we say, yes, let's embrace values and narratives based on those values, are we losing something as human rights people? Mm -hmm. Let's take a couple more. Thank you. Um, so my question is a little bit about how do we reconcile sort of our work and narrative and our power to influence narrative when, and I think this is something we touched yesterday, ma the machinery maintaining the other narrative is much, much stronger than us yeah. and much, much um, resourceful. Yep. So, you know, what, what tools do we employ there? Because yep. we're, we're not going to have it. Maybe one more here. Yeah, thank you. Um, my question is related with the legitimacy, no, on the narrative, but the voices. Mm -hmm. behind, behind the narrative, there's a face, there's someone that tells something that must take like the credibility. And the challenge, even if we can have like the like the your Nike video, yeah, that's great. But who's telling the stuff? You know, most of our, of our values or more many of our narratives have been playing in the other side in a way. Mm -hmm. And it's not necessarily about narratives. It's also about the connection between narrative and voices and legitimacy of the actors. And that's a reflection about how was the the new progressism or the all progressism connected with narratives. It's like shaping the narrative or it's shaping the actors as well. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. So all really simple questions. Um, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> one on how, I mean, if I can paraphrase and, and please just take one, um, you don't have to take them all, but one on really power and messengers, kind of authority. <laughs> the other on, I think the really good one on, there's big I narrative infrastructure, like, Fox News, and then there's small high narrative infrastructure like our more modest attempts. Um, and then on this question of what do we lose if we um, uh, emphasize values and narratives uh, instead of leading with a kind of rights-based framework. So what is lost? Um, uh, really important question. So uh, anyone want to try any of those um, very simple true-false <laughs> <laughs> questions on <laughs> multiple choice? <laughs> I'll go last this time just to see which way to go pick because I've got something to say about all three of them. <laughs> um, I mean, maybe with regards to your question about the rights and values, um, I mean, I would certainly take a longer view on it 
or, or a bigger view? Because I think we are in a moment where democratic institutions are being deliberately dismantled. And I think the human rights framework and the human rights mechanisms that accompany it have also taken a hit. Mm -hmm. And so how it is that human rights in the world is perceived, mm -hmm. overlaid by a very aggressive and rising inequality mm -hmm. raises all kinds of interesting questions, you know, in terms of human rights. I think that, I mean, there are people that we work with, um, you know, in communities in the global south who really believe that rights only belong to those who can buy them. Mm -hmm. Because I'm not seen and I don't matter. I don't have rights. And so I think when you are in that paradigm, and I think we are in a paradigm, where, and I don't know what this means even as I say it, where the old logics, right, are doing this. They're not sustaining us. Yeah. The paradigm is breaking up. But we don't have anything that is, that's formative yet, right, to, to substitute, to replace. We're in this thing, right? And I think for me, this talk around values is part of the vehicle that I don't know but that is potentially mm -hmm. allowing for a slightly different conversation mm -hmm. around the meaning of rights or humanity as a way of getting us to something. I don't know what the something is. So, I mean, that's the way that I would, I would answer that question. In terms of your question, for us, the key tool is movement building, is building collective power in a way where you've got the large critical mass to be able to say the same thing in different ways, in different languages. But, you know, and that's probably not the answer that you're looking for. <laughs> but, but, yeah, I mean, uh, that, that's the way that I would, I, I would contribute to that. Um, I think that in terms of the third question for me, it's a really interesting one. And again, for me, it's that moment, right, where lots of things are merging and lots of things are, are fragmenting. And so, you know, I always sit with this question, um, yes, what does it mean? for Nike to now have, you know, the hugest audience with the most progressive messaging, right? While at the same time feeding, you know, quite an aggressive capitalist agenda, question mark, question mark. It's the same with global citizen. What does it mean for Beyonce, right? To be traveling around the world and mobilizing, you know, young people around really progressive messages, um, given the years and years and years of work you know, that activists in communities have been doing and saying maybe exactly the same thing, but not necessarily being heard. And so for me, there's a real tension there, you know, about what we do with that. Um, and I don't have the answer to that. But I think for me at the heart of that, um, and maybe this is contested, there's something about how messages get depoliticized and taken up. And yes, that may be a sign of victory, Right? But we know from history that we also need to guard right, the gains um, because, yeah, I mean, we, we've, got, we've got a history of the depoliticization of, of a whole range of things, including gender. Mm -hmm. It reminds me <laughs> of uh, one of my board members, Jeff Chang, talks about um, on this question of changing narratives or engaging narratives. He says it's also important to remember that we have to sometimes defend narratives exactly. as well, mm. that there has been progress mm. made. And a lot of our work has, has to also kind of be about buttressing the narratives yeah. that we know to be um, inclusive and, yeah, sure. and progressive. Um, Thomas or Julia, any thoughts on these so go questions? Yeah, go ahead. By the way, one, one thing I forgot to say is where you can actually read our report. So we haven't printed off loads of copies for you to leave in your hotel rooms. It's on <laughs> www.justlabs.org forward slash B hyphen B hyphen narrative. And you can download the PDFs there. Um, yeah, I mean, the question on sort of rights versus values, I actually see them more as complementary muscles and you need both. And what the people in our labs were human rights lawyers primarily. And what we saw was more we've just overstrengthened the bicep of law and mm. institutions and weakened mm. the tricep of uh, empathy and <laughs> culture and values. And, and what I found very, what, what really helped human rights lawyers was thinking like framing a narrative is always there, even if you think and a lot of us think in the, in the sort of from the more legal perspective that institutions and legal frameworks are neutral. 
And I'm sure any feminist would tell you that, like, you know, if they, they, they would have said man if it wasn't for exactly. Messi Guetta, right? I mean, it was okay. nearly, UDHR nearly didn't have the word, um, yeah. nearly the rights of man. Okay. So, the first of all, I think is that idea that actually there's, it's never neutral, but I think the point is they go together. Um, so, the word, we will never, we can't change values and, and narrative just by doing things we consider, say, culture, actually pushing for policies and laws and people seeing laws passed changes their perception of what's common sense and acceptable, you know, when you, but on the same time, just passing a law saying outlawing domestic violence won't stop it, but you need also the cultural shift, you need to change how men behave to change it, but also actually passing the law might make men think, oh, that's not acceptable anymore, and they might change, so I feel like it's about the two, the two go together, um, and so none of those legal organizations are planning on firing all their lawyers, the point is they, they know if they change, the, they need to also work on changing norms. Like the U.S. Supreme Court decided a few years ago to legalize gay marriage. It, made this, had, it pondered the same decision 20 years ago and made a different decision. So, you know, unfortunately, even the most high level officials are not neutral. They all make decisions based on what they consider exactly. acceptable. And I think it's a great question on like the resources. I think we're in a really exciting time in terms of social media where different ideas can take root and spread quite quickly. Uh, there's a writer called Rebecca Solnit who wrote this book called Hope in the Dark, where she said, violence is the power of the state, nonviolence and imagination are the power of civil society. And so what I think is that once they take root, like the Me Too movement, you can't go back anymore. Like, look at, like, I grew up in the west of Ireland in the 1980s. People didn't know what trans was. Now it's mainstream. We have that power of our values and our ideas that can take root, and then once they're there, they can't be uprooted anymore. I think that's the tool we need: like creativity and imagination, things that surprise people and touch them at a deep emotional level. And that actually will be achieved by raising up those voices. Exactly. Um, and I think that's how we win. Mm -hmm. um, so here, here to what <laughs> my co-panelist just said. Um, you know, in the United States. Um, next week, we're about to celebrate Thanksgiving. Some of you might not know about Thanksgiving, but if you come from a very big family, you have a grown-up table and you have a kid's table. And I had a board member once tell me, it is time that you consider yourself as having a seat at the grown-up table. And stop thinking of yourself as like always at the kid's table. And and. That, that is what came to my mind as we were talking about the voices, <coughs> the power we have. It's like, and I am drawn to, um, you know, I mentioned yesterday the writing of Jeremy Hyman of, of new power, that you are more powerful than you think. Mm -hmm. And even in this room, talking about, you know, the feelings of, of the power imbalances mm -hmm. and, dare I say, even the biases that we have of the Nikes of the world taking our narrative and i want to say let you know let's ride that narrative wave let's sit at the grown-up table let's use whatever voices and partnerships we want and we, it was so inspiring to see what you all were doing in peru and the the depth of and the breadth of, yeah. of partnerships that you built to get your message out and so i i do think um that we need to kind of own the power mm -hmm. that we have mm -hmm. um start talking about that a little bit more mm -hmm. and not shy away from the, the, the voices that are going to start wanting to join us and asking if they deserve to be with us or not mm -hmm. because of what else they represent. And that's the narrative braiding in my mind. Yes, you are a part of a capitalist system and yet you somehow want to be a part of a conversation about values that I share and I want to put out there. And yes, I feel that there's voices um, that have been saying this all along, you know, young people of color in urban areas of the United States talking about gun violence for years. And then these white kids all mm, of a sudden get exactly. all of the attention. And we can either segment out our population to be aggrieved by that, or we can find our common goals and we can push out our narratives together. And so I want us to see ourselves as having a seat at the grown up table um, for all of this work and build up those partnerships to have the, the bigger voice that we want to have with those that sometimes it might feel like uncomfortable bedfellows. Mm -hmm.
can I just say, I want yeah, to hear please. what you think as well as expert yes. about <laughs> power, because you know, you're the expert. <laughs> uh, well, I don't know about the expert, but on the question of power yeah. or power and rights. What about or... like, how do we deal with the Fox News as that imbalance? Yeah. Um, well, this is where I think we can't separate questions of policy and lived experience. I think there is uh, the current appetite around tech regulation, around uh, looking at um, algorithmic bias, mm -hmm. is part and parcel of the struggle for engagement of narrative. Because mm -hmm. how, no matter how you look at it, in whatever dimension, economic or political, there are asymmetries that cannot be solved simply by narratives, but have to be kind of co-addressed by narratives as well. So I think we have to mm -hmm. kind of imagine doing um, multiple things um, at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, and the coda that I would offer to my um, somewhat um, provocative question around <laughs> polarization and the reason why I thought of it is because um, I'm, I'm pretty convinced that human beings need, um, need, need bad guys, mm -hmm. as the expression goes. Uh, there, no story without an mm -hmm. antagonist is, is um, compelling. And I'll offer one um, um, a social science experiment. Uh, in England, where Arsenal and Manchester United are very <laughs> competitive football teams, they did a study where um, they brought a number of uh, Manchester United fans into a room in a university and primed them uh, with the question of, why do you love Man U? Uh, and then they said, we're going to go to another room and talk more. Along the way, they had an actor pretend to fall on their pathway who was wearing an Arsenal jersey. So <laughs> they found when they asked these Manchester United fans, why do you love Manchester United? There's a very low level of assistance to the person wearing an Arsenal jersey. So this is the optimistic part. When they asked that same group instead of why do you love Manchester United, instead they asked them, why do you love football? They found a much higher rate of, of helping the Arsenal fan mm -hmm. because they were wearing an Arsenal mm -hmm. jersey. So there's the case for optimism. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The one group where it did not matter what question <laughs> you asked them was the person who had fallen in front of them wearing a football jersey without a team association. So there always has to be an out group. And I would offer that mm. there are experiments around progressive populism where people are trying out if the out group necessarily mm. has to be people or if they can be things such as corporations mm. right mm -hmm. um, or if they can be mm -hmm. internal struggles mm -hmm. like greed mm -hmm. which is a kind of human mm -hmm. thing that everyone has and um, so I would offer that I think mm. um, a lot of people talk about the difference between uh, not a lot of people there, but there's an, uh, uh, some interesting um, theories that I've seen around the difference between um, horizontal polarization, mm -hmm. where there are social groups and you polarize against parts of them, versus vertical polarization, where there is an elite and there is power and there's yeah. interest, corporate mm -hmm. interest, and that the opportunity of this moment is to uh, change to a vertical polarization, understanding that power is vertical mm -hmm. and that the horizontal mm -hmm. is not the right dimension mm -hmm. of engagement. So I, I offer that yeah. footnote, and I think um, our panelists have um, really uh, shared a lot to dig into now in small groups. So I'd love to end before we go into the small groups with a round of applause for our panelists for a great conversation. <laughs>